Story time. When I was a young teen, I finally gained enough mastery of the English language to start watching animated movies without subtitles. Lucky for me, I lived through a golden age of copyright infringement where people would just post entire movies on YouTube, split into nine parts, and nobody would bat an eye. Yeah, that's right, you kids nowadays don't know what's good. Life was only worth living if you were watching Death Note on a family computer at 2am at the worst possible quality. After watching through Disney's entire animated movie catalog, YouTube picked up on the fact that I liked animated movies and recommended me a little flick called The Swan Princess. The art style looked pretty neat and I was constantly starved for content, so I decided to watch the whole thing. But what I didn't know was that I was about to be assaulted by the strangest deja vu feeling. Scene after scene, I would be looking at this movie I had never watched in my whole life, and it was like it was trying to awaken something hidden deep within the dark pits of my memory. It was a solid 7 out of 10. The next day, I talked about this weird feeling I had while watching this obscure animated movie, and my mom was like, oh, the Swan Princess? Yeah, you had the book. Anyway, then I forgot about the movie for 10 years and randomly remembered it now. Is it worth remembering, though? Let's find out. I want to talk about the Swan Princess. The Swan Princess is a 1994 animated adaptation of the Swan Lake Ballet, released at a time where everyone who wasn't Disney was just trying to do whatever Disney did. In Princess Swan's case, the movie was actually made by an ex-Disney director, Richard Rich, who I can only assume was named after his last name. He was let go from Disney and retaliated by starting his own studio and copying the Renaissance formula. But unfortunately for him, he ran into some production issues and had a really disappointing box office performance. Which is funny, because despite his name, the movie didn't seem to make him very rich. The film, along with like 85% of 90s rom-coms, starts with a couple who will definitely fall in love, but hate each other when they first meet. Odette is King William's daughter, and Derek is Queen Uberta's son, and the royal parents decide that it would be awfully convenient if the kids married each other. So every summer, the two heirs are forced to spend time together in the hopes that they will fall in love. Our first musical number follows the pair along the years, and I gotta say, it's a really fun time. You've got these two kids who can't stand each other, but are forced to interact because their parents said so, and I find it very relatable. It's like being stuck with that cousin you don't really like at a family reunion, or having to play with the son of your dad's co-worker because the adults are too busy talking. It's also a good opportunity for us to explore their different personalities. Derek and his best friend Bromley keep trying to ditch Odette, but she refuses to let herself be excluded. Derek complains about how she's constantly making him play dress-up or always wins at card games, but that only means Odette was able to persuade him into joining the game. Even if he claims to hate her, and even if she says she feels the same, they sure seem to spend a lot of time together. Another thing that's striking to me is how the song gives Odette a lot more character than it does for Derek. The princess goes through multiple styles, from the tomboy kid to the flirty teen, proving herself to be both intellectually and physically skilled, but Derek just remains the same throughout the years. He doesn't even change his haircut. When they are reunited for the millionth time, now as adults, their true feelings take over and they realize they might actually be quite fond of one another. But when Derek confesses, Odette is annoyed that he only seems to like her for her beauty. Which, I mean, is fair, because throughout that whole song earlier, he seemed absolutely clueless to the concept of character development. After he fails to give her another reason to get married aside from the fact that she's hot, Odette refuses his proposal and calls off the wedding, leaving with her dad back to their kingdom. As they're on their way, they are attacked by the evil wizard Rothbart, and Derek gets there just in time to hear the king's final words. A great Calimon. It's not what it seems. 
Odette has been captured by Rothbart and put under a spell where she is a swan during the day and transforms into a human at night, as long as she's standing within the moon's reflection on this one specific lake. Every day, Rothbart asks for her hand in marriage, and every time, she refuses. The way this movie deals with marriage is surprising, to say the least. Odette and Derek had been promised to one another, but getting married wasn't exactly an obligation. When Odette calls off the wedding, their parents act like the past 18 years were a waste of time. They had never considered forcing the kids to go through with it if they weren't into each other. Although those summer trips were just an attempt at getting them to fall in love. And I'm baffled that the regents had no plan B after their children spent most of their lives convinced of their mutual hatred. Now, with Rothbart, his plan from the beginning was taking over William's kingdom. But after killing the monarch and kidnapping his daughter, he is still oddly fixated in going through with the legal route. He wants to marry Odette and inherit her land instead of just conquering it through dark magic. Anyway, Odette's personality seems to dull itself a little from this point on. She was presented as such a complex, multifaceted young lady in the introduction song, but now she mostly hangs around singing ballads about how much she loves Derek. Speaking of which, let's check in with the royal boy. After witnessing the king's dying words, Derek is convinced that a great animal has taken her, and that this beast is supposedly not what it seems. So his plans for dealing with it are... attacking every animal. Just... every possible animal. He can't get live animals, so he makes his servants dress up like animals so that he can practice his hunting. I don't know why, but this is so funny to me. It's like if he was told Odette had died of an unspecified illness, so he decided to get vaccinated against every possible disease. Anyway, vaccines are good, please get vaccinated. After a lot of practicing, he even decides to go out into the woods to hunt the great animal, which means hunting down whatever animal he sees. Odette can just sort of leave Rothbart's place also? There's no magic forcing her to stay there, she just won't turn into a person at night if she leaves. Her greatest impediment was how she didn't know where she was, but after she finds a map, she decides to take her chances and go find Derek. She does find him, but he figures that she is the great animal, because why wouldn't she be? She is an animal, after all. He tries to hunt her down, but she guides him into the lake and transforms before his very eyes. The thing with her spell is that it can only be broken if Derek makes a vow of everlasting love and proves it to the world. He says he'll do it at the upcoming ball, where he will announce his love in front of the whole wide world. Or one kingdom, I guess. All Odette has to do is go to the ball, but the problem is that there will be no moon on the next night, so she can't transform. Rothbart takes this opportunity to trick Derek by disguising his assistant as Odette and making him swear in her name instead, which means the original Odette will die, because of a rule that was only announced to the audience halfway through the film. Okay. Derek realizes his mistake and rushes after Odette, but he has to kill Rothbart so the damage can be undone. He recalls the techniques of his training and does this really cool arrow trick to pierce through the wizard's heart and destroy him for good, rescuing Odette and bringing forth the promised union, living happily ever after. What a solid 7 out of 10. If I wanted to be nitpicky, this movie would give me a ton of material. It's just copying the Disney formula with a nice animated fairy tale filled with magic and animal sidekicks, but they're not particularly good at doing it. And it's not like Disney is the only company allowed to make movies like that, but this movie was clearly made to cash in on Disney's success. Odette's character holds a lot of promise, but it's not executed to its full potential. She is angry that Derek won't find value in her beyond her looks, but after she's captured, she seems to have forgiven him for his shallowness. 
My interpretation for her lack of concern is that she believes that they are meant to be together, and Derek just has to grow up a little, but Destiny will make it inevitable that he does, so she's not super worried about it. But that's just my reading, and the movie doesn't give us a lot of material to prove that it's real. She just... kind of forgets about it. Derek is remarkable for how devoted he is to Odette, but his change also loses a bit of the impact it could have had. It would have been neat to see him regret how poorly he has treated the princess along the years, but he only comes around at the very end, making the rest of his development feel a little dull. Also, he has way too much teeth. Why did they keep drawing him showing his teeth? Close that mouth, boy. The rules of this universe's magic are also a little iffy. Derek supposedly has to make a vow to Odette, but nothing in the spell states that he needs to do it while she is present at the announcement. You assume that's how it works, because when he makes the vow to another lady, Odette will die. Which, again, also hadn't been properly established before. It just comes kinda out of nowhere. Odette dying also brings up some questions about Rothbard's plan. He conspires for this to happen, since he sent his assistant to trick Derek, so you assume he wants her dead. So why didn't he just kill her himself, like he killed off her dad? And what benefit would Odette's death bring him? He was so adamant to marrying her so he could legally acquire her land, and she was the only living heir to the throne, so if she dies, he will have no choice but to use magic to take over the kingdom. Or maybe he just wanted her to die so Derek would be annoyed. <laughs> That's really valid. And like I said, this is all just me being nitpicky. I don't suppose most audience members would be exceedingly troubled by these aspects, especially if we're dealing with a younger target demographic. Or one that is afflicted by nostalgia, as I might as well could have been. And you know what else this movie has? A lot to love. Despite my nitpicky tea thing, the animation is really nice. I love the colors of some of these backgrounds, and I think the movie does a fantastic job animating light. There's this whole sequence in a forest where Derek is surrounded by glowing dust specks whenever he steps onto a sunbeam, and it's just so beautiful and atmospheric. They also have some stunning shots of the light reflecting off of Odette's swan feathers, giving her an extra sense of magic and elegance. I am utterly obsessed with these night scenes where Derek's castle is practically a rainbow of stone. They went all out with it. Iconic Disney castles? Nah, give me Derek's rainbow fortress. They also have a real knack for animating water, specifically during the transformation sequences. It's got a fascinating fluidity to it, I could watch it all day. The songs are also worth praising. Not so much the main couple ballad, but all other numbers scatter throughout the movie. I already talked about how the introduction song is a fun time, but all other ones have a certain stage musical aspect to them. If they ever decided to make a Broadway version of The Swan Princess, they would have no trouble translating these dance sequences to the main stage. The choreography is perfectly illustrated. Even if I had some issues with the main couple, Derek and Odette also have their moments to shine. Odette's voice actress especially has some really strong deliveries. I'll die first. And even if the royal sweethearts aren't doing it for you, there's plenty of other entertaining characters to catch your attention. Derek has this incredibly snarky butler-type servant called Rogers, there's the queen and her increasingly outlandish hairstyles, and even some of Odette's animal sidekicks get a good laugh out of me. Let's also not forget about Rothbard, okay? We need to talk about Rothbard. The contrivances in his plans have already been pointed out, and even if he is a powerful wizard filled with revenge and dark arts, he's also such a goofball. He has an entire musical sequence where he sings about how he's not gonna be a nice guy anymore. He's gonna go super evil and curse everyone, and the visuals are just him pranking people and turning them into animals. That's his level of peak nasty, I can't get over this. Even as a villain, Rothbart is surprisingly respectful of Odette. 
I mean, he did kidnap her, but the whole movie places a lot of importance upon the idea of consent. Odette's refusal to marry Derek was all it took for the wedding plans to fall through, and Rothbard wants her to accept his hand out of her own volition. Even when she says she will marry him as an attempt to distract him, he doesn't accept her words, because he knows they are genuine. He doesn't threaten her, doesn't mind control her, he doesn't trick her. He is persistent, but he legitimately won't act upon his plan without her truthful, enthusiastic consent. And I don't know, isn't that a nice vibe? The idea that even in a universe filled with magic and political duties, a lady's no still means no? It's a neat little movie, and I suppose there must be something about it, because they made like 10 direct-to-video sequels with these characters. The director has also moved on to other features like Norm of the North and the Alpha and Omega series, which, despite their controversial quality, were pretty financially successful. Talk about rags to Richards, am I right? Despite the disappointing premiere, the original Swan Princess movie seems to have found success within home video releases, and I'm sure there are plenty of people out there who remember it fondly. Maybe you're one of them, and this video helped bring back some of the memories of the good old days of watching this film. Or maybe you're just finding out about it. Either way, whenever I've watched this movie, I've had a good time. And I hope you've had a good time as well. Thank you for watching. Well, hello there, and thank you for watching this video. Did you watch The Swan Princess growing up? Leave a comment telling me how you first discovered this movie. I had the book as a kid, but I don't think I had actually watched the thing until I caught it on YouTube. If you liked this video, leaving a like would totally help out my channel, and if you're into this sort of thing, you can subscribe too! I want to give a special thanks to my Patreons, you guys are fantastic and your support really, really means a lot. If you would like to join the gang, you can click the link in the description. You can also follow me on Twitter, the link's gonna be down there too. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you on my next video. Bye! You should write a book. How to offend women in five syllables or less.